Gracious Heavenly Father, you have drawn the circle wide. And because of your grace and mercy and what you have done through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, no one stands alone. And so we offer you these gifts, and we ask that you multiply them so that they might help build your kingdom on earth where no one stands alone so that we might be of service to the body of Christ. Now, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, lift us up into your presence to hear the promise of your word and know the joy of your salvation. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. And if our ushers were unable to get to you, we'll have plates in the back as folks are exiting. And you can drop your offering in there as well. Thank you, choirs. Thank you, Reed and Susan and Al and Ronnie. Thank you all. This morning, I want to invite you to consider what are the desires of your heart. What is it that you want? What is it that you want deep down? What are those things that you, you earnestly pray for? If Jesus were to say, what is it you want for me to do for you? How would you respond? What is it you want me to do for you, Mary Alice, Gordon, Fred? How would each of you respond? Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel Selection in the Revised Common Lectionary. I want to invite you to open up your pew Bibles now, and we're going to be in Mark 10, but we're going to be in verses 35 to 45. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the other ten had heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. And so Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is it you want me to do for you? In our text today, we read of this this awkward interaction between Jesus and two of the disciples, James and John. James and John, they come to Jesus and they, they say, do what we want. And Jesus doesn't answer that. He, he, he rather wisely replies, well, what is it you want me to do for you? And what do James and John want? James and John want what, what many of us seek. Right? Prestige, standing, honor, 
They're ambitious. And though their, quest may be, uh, their request may be uncomfortable for us, it is certainly not unfamiliar. And Jesus ultimately says, look, that's not for me to decide. And, and we read then that the other disciples, they become angry. So in today's text, there are these two overarching principles that I'd, I'd like for us to consider this morning. And the first is this. The first is that discipleship is costly. Discipleship is costly. Following Jesus comes with a cost. In, in his interaction with James and John, Jesus is clear that that, <clears throat> that that call to them to follow him is going to come at a cost. Now, it's, it's helpful to understand or, or know if you look in your Bibles at the passage that precedes this immediately, we find Jesus' third prediction of his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. So, so this conversation happens within that context. We, we can know that this baptism and this cup that Jesus refers to when he says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or, or be baptism with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus intends this to refer to his coming suffering. And Jesus goes on to say, indeed, you will drink from this cup as well. You will be baptized with this same baptism. You, you're going to suffer for my sake as well. You will be called to give yourselves away. Last week in, in week one <clears throat> of our series on stewardship, I challenged you to consider how it was that, that, that you were giving yourself away. That is, how are you giving away your time? How are you giving away your, your talents, your abilities? How are you using your skills to further the kingdom of God? And how are you giving away your finances? To be sure, discipleship is a call to giving away all three. It's not a matter of, of one area instead of another. And that being said, there may be seasons of life where, where you are giving more proportionately in one area or another. You may be in a season of life where, where you have a fixed income, but, but you have more free time to give. Or perhaps you've recently been connected or made aware of a, of a ministry in our community here, some way of giving that fits your unique talents and abilities where God is calling you to step into that space. I think of our middle school parents who are in the midst of building sets and painting backdrops across the street for the Lion King. You can't miss it in November 5th and 6th. It's going to be incredible. Those are unique gifts and abilities I don't possess. Or you may be particularly financially gifted. You may have abundant financial resources. And so you may be called to give more in any one of these three areas, but we are for sure called to give all three. Discipleship, friends, is a call to give ourselves away. So if, in fact, discipleship is costly, what is it costing you? When you hear that, <clears throat> I want to encourage you not to give in to the temptation to cynically cheapen the question. It's not about a dollar amount. You see, calculating the cost of discipleship means understanding what you might have otherwise done with those resources. Money, for example, is worthless on its own. Money is merely a, a representation of what you could have. The cost of giving it away is what the money could have secured for you, what it could have bought for you. In the same way that the cost of giving your time and abilities is, is what you could have done with your time or what you might have done otherwise with your abilities. So in light of that, what is discipleship costing you? And maybe the question, or excuse me, the answer is, is, is I don't know. And if that's the case, that's okay. We want you to use this season of stewardship as a time of introspection, of self-examination, to begin asking that question and to begin prayerfully considering how God is calling you into service. 
Have you ever asked God that question? God, how are you calling me to give myself away? The second principle that that we'll talk about this morning follows directly from the first. It's that discipleship is costly, but it is not transactional. Discipleship is costly, but it is not transactional. Let's dig into that a a bit. First, again, how do the disciples react to James and John's request of Jesus? How do the disciples react when they find out what James and John have asked? They're angry. They're angry, and to be sure, their, their anger is not because they have some clearer understanding of how the kingdom of God operates, but rather because they have the very same ambitions that James and John have, and they're annoyed that they got there first. (laughs) They're annoyed that James and John thought to ask the question before they did. And we can know this. We can know this because of how Jesus responds to their dissatisfaction. If your Bibles are still open, have a look back down at verses 42 to 44. Jesus calls them all together, and he says this, You know that among the Gentiles, among everyone else, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Jesus says, I know how the rest of the world operates. And it's not going to be like that for you. And it's not going to be like that for us. In the rest of the world, when you follow, when you join someone else's campaign, you expect to get something in return. Jesus says, that's not how this is going to work. In order to become great, you must become servants. In order to become first, you must become slave. In effect, Jesus here says, to be my disciple, you have to give, and you have to give, and then you have to give some more. And the same is true for us today, and it is so challenging because the world around us just as it was in those days, is transactional. It's how we're conditioned to operate. It's how we're conditioned to see the world. And so how do we break out of that? How do we, how do we realign ourselves to navigate a world oriented around transactional behavior? How do we condition ourselves to, to be oriented differently in a way that Christ calls us to orient our lives. James K.A. Smith is a uh, philosophy professor at Calvin College, and he's written a number of books. And and in his book, You Are What You Love, he tells this story. He tells this story of, um, he says, in 1914, not long after the sinking of the Titanic, Congress convened a hearing to discern what happened in another nautical tragedy. In January of that year, in a thick fog off of the coast of Virginia, the steamship Monroe was was rammed by the merchant vessel, the Nantucket. Uh, In this tragedy, 41 sailors lost their lives in the frigid waters of the Atlantic. And while it was the captain of the Nantucket um, who was arraigned on charges, in the course of the trial, Captain Edward Johnson was was grilled on the stand for five hours. During the cross-examination, it was learned that Captain Johnson had, and, and this is a quote from the transcript, had navigated the Monroe with a steering compass that deviated as much as two degrees from the standard magnetic compass. He said the instrument was sufficiently true to run the ship and that it was the custom of masters in the coastwise trade to use such compasses. 
His steering compass had never been adjusted in the one year that he was master of the Monroe. This faulty compass that seemed adequate for navigation that was used by all of his peers eventually proved otherwise. I chuckle at the phrase that Johnson uses to describe the compass, sufficiently true. But it's how his peers were operating. It was, it was just the way they did things. And so my question is, are we navigating this world with compasses that we believe to be sufficiently true? because they look like the compasses that everyone else is using. Friends, discipleship is a call to reorientation. And as Smith puts it, it's, it's a call to calibrating our hearts to the Creator. Now, this does not simply happen up here. It's not a matter of simply learning our way out of this because we didn't learn our way into it. We learned it through activity, through our daily behaviors. And so our reorientation will be a consequence of activity. Friends, we can't think our way, we can't think our heart into proper calibration. And so it is that in giving ourselves away in this act, we actively realign our priorities with the priorities of God rather than the priorities of the world around us. In the sermon sneak peek uh, for this week, I mentioned the notice of hedonic adaptation. Has anyone ever heard of that before? It is this observed phenomena that <clears throat> we adapt to both positive and negative changes in life. You know, for example, we, we look forward with great anticipation to the happiness that, that the next new thing will bring us, right? Perhaps it's something as simple as, as that new pair of shoes. Maybe it's the new iPhone that's coming out, or something maybe even as grand as, as the dream home that we have been waiting for. But once we actually possess them, how quickly we become dissatisfied. Those shoes aren't as exciting. The new iPhone's battery life eventually begins to fade again. And the house, well, the mortgage payments start. Other issues begin to pile up, and that house is not as grand anymore. And this can draw us into what is referred to as the hedonic treadmill. It is this, this cycle <clears throat> of desiring something, of striving to attain it, possessing it, and then adapting. And so we begin to desire again and strive more and attain and adapt. And you see how we get trapped into this cycle of dissatisfaction. You see, the things that we seek to acquire represent something to us far greater than the things themselves. In our minds, there is a, a satisfaction, a joy, a completion that we seek that is ultimately left unsatisfied, unacquired, and incomplete. This summer, my niece may have bumped up against this in a very true, in a very profound way. We, we have been traveling for the last seven or eight years up into the mountains in North Carolina, and, and there is this very specific toy store that the grandkids get to visit every year. It has become somewhat of a, a rite of passage. And in this particular year, my niece, who was five years old at the time, had decided that she needed a wallet. And so she walked into this toy store proudly and excitedly. And she was going to pick out the perfect wallet. 
Well, it was some time later that my sister-in-law, Emily, found her in a corner of the store, clutching the wallet and sobbing. Inconsolable. And and Emily moved quickly to try and, and bring her out of it, to cheer her up. She says, the wallet is perfect. Aren't you excited? To which my niece responded, Yes, but if I pay for the wallet, I won't have any money to put in it. (laughs) Now, we may chuckle at this, but what this five-year-old profoundly understands that so many of us miss is that once purchased, these items they all lose their ultimate value. And it's this cycle that the designs of our culture naturally draw us into. So how do we get out? Our walk of discipleship of reorienting our hearts is a daily practice of learning to step off of the treadmill so that we, rather than being trapped in this endless loop, we step off and move towards the kingdom of God. Discipleship is costly. But it is not transactional. And it is not transactional because discipleship is transformational. Through it, we step forward and towards the kingdom of God. Friends, Discipleship is not transactional. As we give and give and give, we don't do so in order to get something in return. But when we do, we become something else. We become the people that God has created us to be. And so, friends, we want to invite you in 2022 to say yes to an invitation that God extends to each person. That God extends to each and every one of us. We invite you to say yes. So that when Jesus asks, what is it you want me to do for you? We might say, to learn to give ourselves away and to become the people that you've created us to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.